Hey folks, welcome to this week's News and Community Spotlight. On February 27th, our team will bring Unreal Circle to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Unreal Circle is a free event that features technical sessions from our tech support team, as well as local UE developers sharing their experiences and case studies. If you're interested in attending, you can get more info about the event and register today using the link below. Mendesk is a relatively new company that's already generating a buzz as the makers of the first VR and AR platform to be natively integrated within CAD software. With Mendesk, you can model 3D geometries directly with your hands and work collaboratively with non-technical stakeholders without the need for physical prototypes, enabling CAD users to get high-quality dynamic feedback of materials and lighting. Mendesk plans to launch the Unreal Engine integration in Q1 of 2019 and invites interested parties to apply for early access as part of their closed beta program. In just a few months, EGX Rest 2019 will take place from April 4th to 6th at London's Tobacco Dock, and we've once again partnered with them to double UE4 developers' show floor space at no additional cost. In addition to the extra floor space, developers will have PC equipment and artwork provided. Information on how to get involved is available on our blog below. There's limited space available, so sign up soon to secure your space at the show. And don't forget, we'll be kicking off our winter UE4 jam soon. The theme will be announced at the end of the live stream on February 14th, and then jammers will have five sleepless days to create their masterpieces. Jammers will have access to resources from Assembla, Side Effects, Soundly, and Game Textures, with a chance to win Intel SSDs, red chairs from DX Racer, or our grand prize raffle is an Unreal Engine branded decked out Tiki from Falcon Northwest. Sign up today and get ready to jam. A few years ago, Unreal Dev Grant recipients Red G Studios embarked on their journey into game development and have now proudly produced their first title, Sun, which is coming exclusively to PlayStation 4. Set in the modern day, you'll play as Robert Alderson, who is in search of his missing son, lost somewhere in the Pennsylvania forest, better known as South of Nowhere. We connected with Red G Studios founder Jordan Davenport to learn more about the project, discuss a few of the fears that first-time developers face, and talk about the highs and lows of showing your first game to the world. Read the full interview linked in the comments. On to our weekly Karma earners. Thank you to these folks for supporting other devs on Answer Hub. Thompson N13, Kairos, Shadow River, Aizaki, Kai Yoshida, Nebula Games Inc., Jackie, Chira, a North Star, and S. Rombouts. To hear your name, head over to Answer Hub and share your UE4 knowledge too. Recently released into early access, our first spotlight, Himeko Sutori, is a tactical turn-paced RPG that combines intimate character development with epic battles featuring hundreds of unique characters. With the included campaign editor, you can make new worlds and new adventures, making Himeko Sutori your own story. Sky Shepherd is our second spotlight this week, a GDC 2019 Intel runner-up. Sky Shepherd is a game where the last remnant of past civilization is hurting the mystical creatures of this world while trying to avoid dangers that lurk in the sky. You can see the full trailer over at their art station page. The last spotlight today is a video honoring the renowned architect Dame Zaha Mohammed Hadid. It's a recreation of the 1000 Museum located in Miami, Florida and they've just done a really nice job setting up this scene and paying their respects. Thank you for joining us for our news and community spotlight. Hey folks, welcome to our Unreal Engine live stream. I'm your host, Amanda Bott. With me we have Richard Hinckley, Senior Documentation uh, Engineer. So thank you for joining us. Thanks, great to be back. And Victor, our one of our latest community managers. That's <laughs> right. Our latest community manager. Um, so yeah, before we <coughs> dive in, we're actually going to be dropping a few keys in chat to today for Box the Game. It's a puzzle game where it challenges you to use your brain a little differently. Um, it's got boxes and you're recreating shapes with these elements. So look for those in chat as we're going throughout the stream. But would you like to give a bit of an overview of what you'll be going over today? Sure. Um, so we got a few questions about exposing C++ functionality uh, to 
to designers or artists or other uh, non-C++ coding uh, developers. And uh, I don't think we ever really comprehensively went over all this on a stream. So I've, I know I've touched on it in the past, and I've talked about the importance of exposing this functionality, but we never really went through uh, a lot of the fine details. So today mm -hmm. we're going to spell that out a little further than we usually have. Okay. Um, it's definitely an important topic. <laughs> And with lots of questions, it's a, it's a good <laughs> one to follow up on. So yeah, uh, feel free to dive right in. All right, so let's go. So we'll start with uh, the the three main ways that you can expose uh, you can expose your code. We're really going to cover two of them. The third one is more is is more of a way for you to hook into code from the blueprint side. Mm -hmm. But to have blueprints hook back into C plus plus code, the two you really need are blueprint callable and blueprint native event. Uh, the third one is Blueprint Implementable Event, and that's one that you can call from C++, and it's implemented in the Blueprints. It's not actually implemented in C++ code, so that one sort of goes in the other direction, uh, which is, I, I've covered this in the past, but it's a, it's a good one for something happened, the artist might want to play a particle effect or a sound effect here, give them a little hook so that it'll, it'll call into their Blueprint at this point. Um, Blueprint callable is the first one we're going to deal with today. It's the exact opposite of that. Here's a C++ function, and you can call it from blueprints. That's pretty straightforward. Um, a blueprint native event is a little bit, a little bit more complex to write, not much, but what it allows is uh, not only can you call it from blueprints, but you can also override it in the blueprint. So you can have a default behavior in C++ that then an individual blueprint can customize, change, completely rewrite, whatever they want to do with it, but there is that default behavior. Um, a, so, whereas a blueprint callable gives you a behavior and that's it. Um, so, let's see, so we'll start with these two, with these two functions. So, our functions are going to be pretty simple. Um, I'm just, I'm doing this mainly for engineers, so I'm just going to log out when we call the function and you can you can see that's where the function is called, and then this is what you would just replace with your real code. Uh, so all the functions today are just going to be that. They're not going to do anything terribly interesting. Um, but you'll see how they hook up. So, <clears throat> and we'll start, oh yeah, we'll start with the syntax too. So I wrote a simple blueprint here. Um, just on begin play, uh, this particular actor calls our exposed function, and then our exposed virtual function, and just sort of prints out the return values it gets from them. So just very straightforward stuff. Um, but, as you can see, we take an input parameter here, uh, and we, we've, we've of course, tagged these as, blue func as blueprint functions. Uh, we, we take this input parameter, and we come back with an output parameter. These are optional, but I wanted to show you quickly, if you don't give it any parameters, what you'll get. It looks a, it looks a little different, but it functions the same. So, we're going to call this simple exposed event with no parameters. And get back to the engine. It's only take a few seconds to do this. So, you can see the two functions that we had, simple exposed function and simple exposed virtual function. Of course. Of course that would happen because Mm, what I, oh, right, because I didn't actually, didn't actually write the function. That's okay. As you know, um, at some point I was going to say this, but in every single stream, there's a point where things mysteriously don't work or don't compile. <laughs> this was not very mysterious. I, I just didn't write the function that I promised the computer I was going to write. Uh, but, oh, you should and keep your promises. I should, and the linker will enforce that I do. So <laughs> let's see. So we're just going to... Computers do what you tell them to do. They, they do, and in that case I told it not to compile live. Um, all right, so again, this should only take a few seconds. Uh, all right, and this time it works. So if I call uh, what I call simple event, so there we go. That actually doesn't look as different as I thought it would. Okay. Whoops. Sorry, let me. This is actually a little tough to click about. Zoom in a bit. So I can call this, and I'll just print it out the same way as these other two. I think maybe it's with native events. If you do it with native events, you get uh, it looks like this. 
you get one of these red boxes instead, instead of a blue. I think that's just with natives, though. So, uh, but we'll put that in. When would you use native instead of um, ah function? So, as I was saying a little bit earlier, so so an example of where you'd use a native is um, if I want uh, if I want to be able to change the behavior. So I have a function that I can call from blueprints and it'll do something. But one of the blueprints might want to override it or do some special logic around it. And in that case, I use a native because when I use a native, like my simple expose native function here, I can change what it does. Inside blueprints. Inside blueprints, I can change what the C++ function does. Now, if I need the original C++ functionality, which I often will, and this is, a, this is a, actually a major point, I can call the parent function. Now, this will be either the, if this is an inherited blueprint, like coming from another blueprint, it will, uh, it will call that blueprint's version of this function. In this case, we're inherited directly from our C++, I did not mean to click that, but I did, whatever. We're inherited directly from our C++ class. Uh, it'll call the C++ version. So it'll just call whatever the next, the next step up in the hierarchy is. And that's important because let's say this is doing something that's absolutely mandatory. If your designers don't call this, your mandatory C++ code won't get called. On the other hand, if they don't want to call this, they don't have to. So there, you, you may design it on purpose to make it so that they can ignore the default behavior and they'll be allowed to do that. But as programmers, you're usually used to, whenever you have a virtual function, you call super colon colon same function name. You just pass your input uh, parameters up the, up the chain and then check the return value before you go on. That's, that's the thing you're probably used to doing a lot when you're writing code. But designers don't necessarily have this hammered into them by years and years of coding. So just make sure, you know, and if your designer comes back with a bug in, in one of these functions, check here first because very often someone has just forgotten to call the super class uh, simply because that's not, as, that's not as commonly required a thing in design as it is in uh, programming. So we'll put a quick print here that says um, BP override. And there we go, that's all hooked up right there. <laughs> the ugliest, <laughs> I, I don't know why I organized this this way, but I just sort of threw all the nodes out there. There, that, that looks passable. All right, that's legible. It'll do. Yeah, uh, let's get back to the event graph here. And, uh, and we'll call that as well. What, what is that called? Simple exposed name. Oh, right. That was, that was another thing that I wanted to show. I think I interrupted you there. <laughs> yeah, I didn't quite get to that, but that's, that's, that's perfectly all right. So this blueprint native event can't be called, and I, I sort of spilled the beans there by trying to drag it out, but because it has to be blueprint callable and blueprint native. So what's kind of interesting about that is that that means that I can, I can still override it even though I can't call it directly from the blueprint. So just bear in mind that if you want them to be able to call it from the blueprint, that is separate from saying that they can override it with the blueprint. Um, so we just add blueprint callable, push that button. What's the shortcut you're using? Oh, I'm hitting button. control shift B. It's just the, the build. Uh, it's this one, build solution, which you can't do while you're building, but uh, there we go. Now I can call it. We want to glean into all of your little <coughs> fast workflows here. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that is definitely part of the fun of this is, uh, wait, whoops, is making mistakes live on camera in front of a whole lot of people. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's, it's the life of a programmer, really. Anyone out there who, who does this for a job knows that your day is basically constantly, oh, why does this work? This should totally work. And uh, I personally like the, the rubber ducky method, if anyone's ever, heard of this or if you haven't heard of this, this is <laughs> we were just talking about this the other day oh actually. you were yeah. yeah okay well perfect so everyone sort of I'll, I'll go through really quickly i i talk to either an inanimate object or a person who just says yep mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's it and then eventually i talk myself into explaining yeah. why this thing that can't possibly fail is flawed it's just just by fully walking yeah. through it and explaining it, i i end up explaining myself into the mistake that right. i've already made through we the explanation of the process yes
it <laughs> clarifies your problem. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's a really great method. Um, I don't know if they teach that in uh, in software engineering courses, like in colleges, but they, they definitely should. Um, all right, so when we hit play here, do, do, uh, well, uh, sorry, I need to get the I need to get the uh, where's the log? Window developer tools output log. There we go. Okay. So let's look at. So you can see um, <clears throat> where I put in those calls to say uh, to say the functions that are being called here. You can kind of see them showing up in yellow in the logs. So that's that's the that's the main point of that. Um, now there's one other difference when you go to program uh, these native functions versus the callables, and that is that with the callable function uh, and well, I'm just going to leave that one that I wrote, whatever, that's fine. With a callable function, they can be virtual or they can not be virtual, and that, that's just your, your own C++ choice. It doesn't really matter because it's not available for blueprints to override anyway. Um, with native functions, though, the base function is not virtual, but this isn't the function. This is the function that you'll call if you want this in code, and it'll, it'll route it to the appropriate place, to the blueprint or to the C++ class, whatever, whatever is appropriate for it. But that's not where you write your C++ code. So the engine will auto-generate the routing calling function in here. You write your code in here in, uh, in whatever the function name is up here with underscore implementation. So this is where the real C++ code happens. Um, and then if you have a child, nope. If you have a child class, so I have this down here. You can override our blueprint callable function like this, or you can override the implementation version. That's key there, the implementation version of our uh, blueprint native function. So that also means that if you want to change something from regular blueprint callable to blueprint native, this, this function doesn't do anything on a blueprint callable. It's just another function with a coincidental name. So you would have to, to change this from blueprint callable to blueprint native. You would have to add this function and then go into your source file and, and change uh, your C++ function just to have this underscore implementation name. That's really the only, the only change that you need to make, to, you need to make there. Um, so probably the biggest, the biggest part of this is um, everything needs blueprint callable if you want it to be blueprint callable. Just saying it's blueprint native is not sufficient. And stress to your, your non-programming teammates <laughs> to call the parent class because I, I know it seems like it, sometimes it seems like it should be obvious because programmers do it all the time, but uh, designers don't necessarily. Mm. They, they, ju they just don't necessarily have that, uh, that like work pattern uh, hammered into them. So make sure to call that. It'll make things go a lot more smoothly. So <laughs> that's, that covers the first part of this. And let me... So what are you pulling up now? Um, so I'm just pulling up the, the, the next part. I wrote this in, as I started doing at the end of my last couple of streams, I started <laughs> writing, you recall, I wrote multiple projects. Right. Uh, knowing that there were going to be catastrophic failures. Um, it's the baking show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes. It's, it's the, the pre-taped call-in show or the, <laughs> the cooking show where they just, they pull out the already baked thing because they weren't going to yeah. go away for four hours while you watch an <laughs> oven. Um, but yeah. So uh, let's see. So, so events and pure functions. Okay. So this is the one where I was actually supposed to talk about events. Um, so here we have a simple exposed native event. This one is the one that appears. I should run that as an event box. So this is basically, it's a void. It has no parameters. This ends up uh, generating an event box. But other than that, it's exactly identical. Um, so you'll see these, and I showed these earlier, but it's the little red box instead of the little blue box. That's, that's really the only difference there. And are we up? We are, but we're over here. Back this way. Okay, so what have I put in here? So I have my actor BP in here. Uh, let's see if we can get into... <laughs> there we are. 
all right, so we have most of the same things here, except for that, that thing that I wrote at the last second. Um, and let's just see, let's just see what our output is. Just remind myself. Play. There we go. Okay, so there's our output. So we have our simple expose function, our virtual function, our and our implementation of these two functions. Um, now, where are, sorry, where's my code? There's my code. Okay, so this is this is mostly the same stuff. There's nothing um, there's nothing tremendously new going on here, uh, but we can start talking about pure functions now. So. A pure function is similar to the concept of const, except it's not quite as strict because this exists as an unreal concept, not as a language level C++ concept. So um, just to refresh people who may have forgotten, a const function is one where uh, the this pointer to your object is a const pointer rather than a regular pointer. And what this does is it prevents you from certain operations, like operations that modify the object that you're calling it on. Mm -hmm. So const is essentially a language level promise that, um, like for example, tell me a file name and I'll open the file for you. I promise I'm not going to mess with your string and return a different string to you than the one you gave me. It's constant, right? right? That string would be a const parameter into, into my function. Or if you say you have uh, your actor, we'll just go to an example here. And you have, am I actually in my, oh, I'm in yep. myActor.h, right? <laughs> I wanted just actor.h. Which ex exists in the engine. <laughs> yes. So this, this is an engine file, and it's huge, but we're just going to go with get actor location. All right, so get actor location, and that's the K2 version of it, but uh, whatever, same thing is a const function. Because when you, when you ask an Unreal actor what its location is, you expect that it will give you the answer to the question but not do anything to the actor. Right? You, don't, you don't want it to change anything, you're just asking a question. So that's, that's what const means. Const is a guarantee that you won't change anything. Pure is a similar guarantee, except you can totally just lie to people about it and change things in a pure function, but don't. <laughs> please don't. Um, so, so in a pure function, let's go back in here, and we'll just, we'll just Drop a few pure functions. Oh, right. While you're running, it's a read-only graph. Let's stop running. So I made two of them. And you notice they look a little different. Um, this is the old-style pure function. It's, and this, uh, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. No, they're both, they're both the same style here. This is, that's a different part. Um, so this one, well, the difference is that this one has the target pin on itself, whereas this one doesn't. That's, that's the only difference. They're both, they're both still green, and the pure functions don't have this exact pin in and out. And that's, that's key. So when a normal function runs, like, um, well, this append is a pure function, actually. So when a normal function runs, what it will do is uh, it'll, you know, the exec goes in, the function then runs, the return value pin gets set based on whatever came back from the function, and then the function ends. And then when another node connects back to look at this, it has a cached value, and it just, it just takes that value. A pure function runs every time. So if I had, so this append here is also a pure function. So if I did something like this append and I put it in multiple different places like this, since it doesn't ever, it doesn't have an execute in pin, you're not telling it when to run, so it simply runs every time you look at one of its return values. That means a couple of things here. The first thing is, uh, don't do really complex, expensive operations in a pure function unless you're, well, you, should, you just shouldn't. The only time that would be okay is if you know that that out pin is only going to one place and it's not going to be referenced multiple times. Because otherwise, again, you will do that calculation every single time, which is kind of a mess. Um, the second thing is, really don't change stuff. Uh, I had, I had a, uh, a bug when I was working on Paragon. It, was only, it only lasted like a day, but this was, this was how I learned about pure functions. We had a pure function for picking when your character either respawns or teleports back to base, and we had like the five, the five points. And so there was a pure function that said, get me the next open teleport spot. 
And what it would do is it would give you the next open teleport spot and then mark that spot as used, so it would put it like back at the bottom of the list. Mm -hmm. um, so the problem with this is that I referred to it in two places, mm -hmm. right? So in one place I said, give me the next teleport spot. Where's that going to be? Oh, okay, so start the particle effect there. And then, okay, and now also move the character there. So two different things, put right. the particle effect and put the character. Well, they were in different spots oh. because the pure function actually did something, which is, say, of all the open spots, uh -huh. this one was the most recently used, so cycle to the next one if available. So the first of the particle effect got this <laughs> one, and then it would spot in the next. The one. character got the <laughs> next one, yeah. And so they, <laughs> unless there was only one spot free, the character always appeared at a different place than the particle effect, mm. which was just not the intention. <laughs> um, but that's why you don't modify things in a pure function. So pure functions should be low cost um, and non-modifying. They don't they don't change anything. Yeah. Um, so here we have just two different versions. Now there's um, there's a thing the engine does for you here. So this is the, the old style where we just tell it explicitly, this is a pure function. So you know, keep that in mind. Um, oh, yes, I've also put this little tag. The, uh, that target pin was going to appear anyway, but I have filled it out with self rather than it being empty. If I didn't, you would have to just basically do this and then hook self up to the pin. But to save your designers, because that's kind of annoying, save your designers that time, uh, you can assume that it's talking about itself. For this type, it just assumes that it's talking about the blueprint it's in, the object that it's in. Um, so, again, they're, they're both blueprint callable. This one, the engine decided that it's a pure function because it's a const function. So that's, that's why this one is const. And, uh, yeah. So that's why this one is const. This one is const even though, well, this one is not, sorry, it's pure. This one is pure even though it's non-const because I said so. <laughs> um, so just, just bear that in mind. You can, you can automatically get pure functions. And this is actually a pretty good habit because, um, because that way you're less likely to, to break the contract. Of course, if you know C++, you know about const casting. You you can just decide that a const pointer is suddenly non-const. And actually, I think I've told this one before, but on Paragon, again, there was one, this is the only time in my entire career, but there was one time when it was legitimately appropriate to const cast something. It was something where we were checking the player's health and we, we, couldn't, we couldn't get it. We, we had to give it a, a non-const pointer, mm -hmm. but it, it didn't modify the pointer. It would have been completely fine. Okay. But the function that, that I needed to like check the player's health or whatever it was, required a non-const pointer. And so even though I wasn't going to modify it, I had to, so I had to const cast away and take a const pointer and turn it into a non-const pointer. That's a <laughs> super bad programming practice <laughs> in general. But it sounds a little convoluted. <laughs> yeah, you just, well, I promise I won't touch this. Okay, turn off that, shh, she's not looking. Turn off that promise. <laughs> like, don't, don't do that. But there, yeah. was, there was one time in the, the 10 years that I spent developing games that that was appropriate. Just one. It happened to be here. Um, Inevitably. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, so, so, that, so that's, uh, that's a good place to use const and just make sure that you're consistent about it. Um, other than that, these two functions are just pretty straightforward. They just do whatever it is, simple. Uh, oh, yeah, this is, a, this is a child class. Here we go. Yeah, here, here are my pure functions. So, yeah, they just, they just multiply your input parameter by three and come back. That's nothing terribly special. Um, but just bear in mind that if we had a, whoops, if we had a property here, like this, uh, I'm just mm, just making a little sample property. So like <laughs> like this. If we pass this in here, what you definitely do not do. Is something like something like this. So this is not a super great idea. Um, how did that say? Okay, I must have messed that up. Like that. So this will change the value of temp value. Okay. We don't want to change that. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a pure function. Avoid any kind of modification in there. Just as an example. Okay, so let me see. Let's get rid of that. We don't really actually need it for what we're doing today. 
All right, so that's, that's basically why we don't want to violate pure. And keep in mind that pure is really useful. Uh, like our math functions use it all the time. Our, our string appends right there that, that we've had this whole time, these are all pures. Uh, these conversions are pure. Like these are, all, these are all really useful functions to have around. And they save your designer from having to string the exec pins through everything. Just bear in mind what they're intended to be used for. And they're, they're a really useful tool if used properly. All right, and then we can go to part three. So we get into some little bit more intricate stuff in the third one. Chat's hopefully <laughs> ready. <laughs> All right. I feel like this is when we pull out the cake so that we can ice it. That's right. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right, so we'll start this compiling and running right away. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so in this one, here we are. So, oh, there we go, back to the main screen. All right, so in this one we have blueprint function libraries. And if you've seen my previous streams, you know that uh, the gameplay statics library is one that I use a ton. I really love the gameplay statics library. It has a ton of really helpful, useful functions in it. So you can make your own um, blueprint function library. Uh, I'll show you how to do that in the editor really quickly. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to click the final button, but you'll see it. So, new class, mm -hmm. right there. Blueprint function library. We're also going to get to interfaces later. They're right here. I think Lauren and I added these when we were we were doing a stream, and we thought, well, that should really, that should really be here. That's its own kind of special thing. So, really glad we added that. Uh, we ended up using that today. So, blueprint function library and Unreal. Uh, interface. We're going to use both of those. So th these are nice because they don't take an object. Um, you don't have to have you know an actor or a U object to call them on. These functions are all static. Now in many cases there will be some sort of uh, world context object and we'll look at we'll look at gameplay statics since I love it so much. Uh, so a lot of these functions will take I know I don't type, didn't type that right. <laughs> okay, there we are. Now we're at the class. Uh, a lot of these functions will take a world context object. And this in many cases is because you need to get something from from the level or from the engine that says, you know, what object are you, what world are you in? So frequently you'll take some sort of object to call them on, but you don't necessarily always need to do that, like in this spawn, uh, <coughs> spawn object function. There's not necessarily everything requires this. Um, so this allows you to build pretty much whatever functionality you want. And so I built, just to be simple about it, I built a little Fibonacci function. Now this I just wrote straight in this file. I could have written it like this and just not exposed it. Um, all, I, all I really have to do is just move the prototype uh, into here, just have, just basically have another one of these lines without the U function. Um, but I didn't, I just wrote it like this, that's fine. And so this is the Fibonacci sequence, right? The, the one, one, two, three, five, eight, mm -hmm. uh, that one. And so here are two ways that we can call this. Again, similar to what we've been doing. You have your regular blu blueprint callable version, and you have uh, blueprint pure. So, as it says, one of these, where is my actor? Here we go. Oh, that's the C++ class. I did not mean to open that. I meant to open my blueprint. Okay, so, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself showing some stuff here. All right, let's look at these. Sneak peek. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got um, time. Yeah, we're, we're, we're reading ahead. So, <laughs> all right, so here it is as a pure, and here it is as a blueprint callable. You can see pretty much the only difference is that this one has exec pins. Um, so Fibonacci is not a tremendously expensive operation, but it does, it does uh, recurse down with, you know, two calls per level. So okay. it's not totally cheap either, at least, you know, the, the function I wrote. Um, where is my function? Here we are. Oh, yes, I was in my actor because I clicked that wrong button. Um, so, yeah. So, here I just have the one piece of code, and it's shared between these. You can see these two functions are 
the same thing. Now there's no const here because these are static functions, so there's no object. Um, it said Andy hi on my screen. That was all right. Um, so there's no object here. These are all static functions. Uh, that's the nice thing about a blueprint function library. You, you don't actually have to have an instance of the library. All the functions in it are static. You can call them from anywhere. Um, and that, that makes it really convenient. Um, but you can still get the opportunity to, because it'll, it'll cache the return value on this node. So you can get the opportunity to run the calculation one time and cache the return value if you want with an exec pin. And if you don't think it's that important and you want the smoothness of operation for your level designers and it's, or your, your game designers, your artists, whoever it is, you can just do this and it'll recalculate every time. The recalculate every time property, by the way, you could use on purpose. If you have a variable that's changing as you go and you want the latest, the latest value of that variable, mm -hmm. you could you know, plug it in and call multiple times and expect a different value in different parts of your code. But just know that that, that is what will happen. Similarly, if this is hooked up to something else that's pure, it will recalculate this as well every time. So if I have this hooked up to some other variable, whoops. There we go. Mm -hmm. So if I have this hooked up to some other variable and then this variable changes, then this will change too. It'll, it'll happen live every time. Oh, Whereas okay. if I hook this up to the output of one of these nodes, I wouldn't do this, but if I hooked it up to the output of another node, uh, it will redo the conversion every time, but it will not recalculate this every time. It'll only recalculate this when you hit when the, that node fires. the input pin. Okay. Yes. So that's... That's the sort of, yeah, don't, don't run a Fibonacci uh, sequence into itself. That's, <laughs> that's probably not a good idea. But um, can you use the uh, copy node there in case you, you, for some reason, want to use a pure function, but you don't want it to run every time? The copy node? The copy node. You mean, oh, oh, oh. You mean, you mean taking the output value mm -hmm. and setting it to a, whoops. It's just copy. And then copy. Um, I have never used that node in my entire <laughs> life. Um, the way that I would cache this value if I wanted to, to do that would be I would Oops. just promote it. Yeah, I, I thought this was the right type. Uh, this is an integer. Is this not an integer? It's an enum, I believe. Oh, it's a byte. No, because, yeah, because I made that off the input. The input I made a byte just uh, just to do it. So let me try that again. So can I promote this to a variable? Yes. Okay, there we go. So, yeah, so if I wanted to do this, I would promote it here. And then once it's set, now I can just, I can just get the variable. I don't have to come back. And I can actually even get it from here because it won't, it won't redo this. It, this. This being a node that has an execute pin won't be rerun, so it won't re-query this every time. So I can either get it from the new var itself, or I can just get it from here instead of over here. And then that'll, that'll, prevent, uh, that'll prevent rerunning the sequence every time. OK, so that covers the, uh, uh, sorry, that covers the uh, blueprint function library. And we'll get, to this. we'll get to this in a minute. This one's kind of fun, but we'll get to that in a minute. We also have interfaces. So interfaces is where we get a little bit heavier into our, into our programming. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of, of why we don't inherit from multiple classes, generally speaking. But the exception to that is when uh, all the classes but one are interfaces. So in this case, my actor is going to take from my interface and my other interface. So I have two interfaces in this file. Uh, my interface is just a basic Unreal interface, and it has this blueprint callable, blueprint native event function here. Um, now, this one is a virtual function, and it has a default behavior, which is just our same, you know, write out the function name and return zero. And it has this one, which is a pure virtual function, so you are, you are allowed to do this. The, the reason I can do this with an interface is because you can't directly uh, instantiate an interface class anyway. So, uh, so this won't cause a problem, but if I derive an actor from this, as I did with my actor over here where I used it, that actor must define uh, that function. So right here. 
it must give that function a body. I returned one just to be extra crafty. So uh, I can give you this with, with a default behavior that you don't have to override, or you can have this, which you must remember to override or it won't compile, um, and it doesn't have a default behavior. Uh, up to you which one you want, but I've, seen, I've certainly seen use cases for, for both of these. Um, an easy example for this might be return my object name, and I don't want to have a default object name. If you forgot to fill that out, I want that to be a compile error because I don't want to be debugging or something, and I ask what your object name is, and you get default name because that now all of a sudden my, my bug hunt has come to an end because you forgot to fill out a function. Uh, this one, on the other hand, if I wanted to have some behavior that maybe doesn't do anything or maybe does do something in your class or has a default behavior but you might want to do extra stuff, any of the other reasons you'd want to have a, a virtual function with a default, this is fine. Um, this also allows us to extend in blueprints, which is pretty cool. So, so an interface, and I would really use the, the, um, the class wizard that I, that I showed earlier for this, but an interface has a, a U object here so that the engine can recognize it. And then down here, it has the, uh, the actual class with your code in it. This class you don't need to touch. And I, I, I remember writing this comment here specifically to, <laughs> <laughs> to make sure people understood that. This class is just here so the engine can know what your interface is. This class is the actual interface that your C++ classes will use. Um, so here are your, your, uh, your U functions. And, uh, and then your actor class can inherit from one or more, as you see here we have two, the base class and then two interfaces, or as many as you want. Um, now this one has a little meta tag on it, cannot implement interface in blueprint. So that's, that's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, that comment was not too far over on the screen I wrote this on. But yes, it, it provides you, it, it prevents you from overriding your interface functions. The um, the thing about that is that it applies to the entire interface. It's not just one or two functions that can't be overridden. It's all of them. Uh, don't put blueprint natives in here because you can't override them anyway. Um, so this, this just gets blueprint callable. And by the way, when you're writing these things, I mean, this, this stream is about exposing functionality to blueprints, but you absolutely can just put in, like, non-exposed functions. You absolutely can put non-exposed functions in here that you just call in C++. That's, that's totally fine. Uh, just not really relevant to the topic of exposing functionality to Blueprint. It's good to know, though. <laughs> yeah, it, it is good to know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a regular C++ interface that also supports exposure to Blueprints. That's, that's really what we're talking about here. So you can keep some things out of Blueprints and, and still expose what needs to be. Yeah, yeah. And I use these, I use these in programming all the time. Like... Anytime you have a game where stuff happens in the game based on other events, like uh, you beat this boss character, then the reward item spawns, or the door unlocks again, or you know you 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 step in this room and then some sequence plays out, or monsters spawn in, or whatever it is, anything like that, I will usually have a system uh, where everything that can respond to a trigger like that will have like a triggerable interface on it mm -hmm. so that I can say, oh, the game wants to trigger you. Do whatever your thing is. is it, if it's spawn an enemy, if it's open or close a door, like whatever it is, you, you've just been called to action here. Do your thing. And then that way, the, the, useful, th the useful thing about this is that I don't have to have a actor and then a child class like a triggerable actor because I might want to have like a actor and then that, you know, maybe that comes down to a pawn, and then that goes off to a special type of character. And then maybe I want to have an A uh, box collider, whatever. And these things don't necessarily have the same parent at any level lower than A actor. Right. Like, they could, they could be coming from different engine classes, like A pawn versus A actor versus A character, for example. Mm -hmm. So they're coming from all these different classes. I don't want to force them all into the same hierarchy, so the interface allows me to say, but you guys have this in common. Right. And this, that's, this is more just general C++ how you use it, but it applies here too. It's, it's, it's exactly the same concept. So I can say all of these things have in common that they're triggerable, and then what I can do in code is see if I can cast it to a triggerable actor, or I could, I could see if it... If it um, I could see if it 
uh, I don't feel like looking through this whole list right now. Um, I could see if it if it implements a certain interface before I try to call this function on it. So that way you can you can get this functionality out to actors that are generally unrelated to each other except for a common uh, let me close that except for a common uh, trait. Uh, so let's see. Now this one's pretty fun. Um, and this is this is the last uh, special thing that I want to show today. But over here we have call. Let me get into my. So this is kind of neat. This is a little bit specialized. You don't want to do this all the time. But there's a, there's a function. This is just a U object function. Call function name with arguments. Um, the main thing here is the function name. That's that's the interesting part. So with this, I can call C++ functions from Blueprint or Blueprint functions from C++, and the engine will know if I've, if I've overridden them. So the engine will know what the lowest level of the function is, and then it'll call that, and it can come back up the hierarchy with uh, parent calls, as we saw before, or not, depending on whatever you wrote. Um, so I have, just through that function, uh, so instead of just connecting this directly to this, I have it call my test BP function. Now the thing is, the thing that's cool about this is C++ code doesn't know anything about this function. Uh, this is purely written in BP. This is a custom event. It's not, it's not inherited from anything in C++. It's not an override of a native function. It's just, it's just a function that's in your blueprint. And from C++ or from blueprint, you can call this function uh, with the function name argument of test BP function, as you can see right here. And that will, let me put a breakpoint. Is this still the key? That is still the hotkey. <laughs> so what's your secret hotkey? <laughs> the hotkey is F9. So there you can see the, uh, by the marker that we've just hit that point in the code. Turn my breakpoint off and resume. And there you can see test BP function. If you saw that, <laughs> if you have really quick eyes, let's try that again. <laughs> test BP function. Right there, and then it vanishes. Can increase the duration there of the string as well if you drop it down. Yeah, I think so. And and it should also print to log, which should mean that it's somewhere in this giant mess, <laughs> which is really helpful. Um, now it is really helpful, but uh, not when you run the program multiple times like that. So yeah, I, yeah. Let's just just for fun. I, I hope everyone saw it last time, but there it is. Test BP function sticking around for a while. Ten seconds. So, um, there we go. So that's, that's an interesting thing in that uh, I can also call u functions with that. Now, this little true override here says to call functions that aren't marked as exec. So if I don't want to mess with that, your blueprint function just needs to be marked as exec. But with the with the true parameter here, you just override that requirement. That's all that does. Um, so this, I've used this in the past where you have a special function that's on like one type of character but not others. And in general, you may have event code that, that runs a special function on a character. Um, but if you want it to be generic and you want it to be able to access C++ code or Blueprint code, you could do this. The only constraint is, of course, that you have to make sure your function names are kept consistent, mm -hmm. so you should you should keep those function names in like a, maybe a function that returns the name, like oh, a gotcha. like an inline function that just returns the name, or in a global table of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to have too many cases where people have to remember exact function names or things like that. That's yeah. that's the thing to avoid. So this is not something. This is what I was saying. This is not something that you use every day, but every once in a while, especially during development, when maybe making an event that calls a function is going to is going to cause you to have to like recompile an extra time. It's really nice when you can just put something in here, give it the function name, and you can see it's 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 a line of code, right? <laughs> um, and you can get that you can get that sort of prototyped out, and then you can possibly clean it up later. I really like it as a development tool primarily. I, I wouldn't necessarily ship with it, but it really saves time when you're when you're uh, when you're calling some special functionality that's specific to a certain character or object in your game. And uh, and you you just want to get it done and see what happens. Um, just yeah, there 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 have been times when you need to do that without recompiling the code every single time. So 
just just keep that in mind. That's just a little trick that exposes both Blueprint to C++ and C++ to Blueprint, which is which is what I really like about it. Um, so nice. that I think that's I think that's the material that I have for today. Um, hopefully, hopefully that was all clear. I, <laughs> I well, we do have some questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's not a hundred percent clear, but let's see what we got. Or expands. Yeah. You want to start with the first one? Sure. I just want to point out we'll also be uh, all this entire stream will be available offline uh, or online, but not live later right. on as well. If you An archive, yeah. weren't able to to follow along entirely, um, or if you just want to dig down a little bit deeper, uh, we got plenty of questions. Uh, let's see if I'll kick off with um, is. If possible, can you show us how to have multiple execution pins on a function for both inputs and outputs? Multiple? Oh, um, I am not. Unfortunately, I'm not an expert on that one. I um, so well, I, I knew how to do this before, and I can't recall. Can it right functions now. have several execution pins? Well, this so this is not a function. This is actually a macro. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can go to the definition of this. Uh, how do I get a definition of this? <laughs> Not sure where the sequence live actually. It's it's in the engines uh, it's in the engines macros, but I can't remember how to get into it. Sneaky. Mm. Yeah. Jared, can you tell us? I I, kn I know there are ways to do it, but unfortunately, I haven't done it at all recently. Oh, yeah. The game. Okay, I know where to look to do this. I don't I don't remember how to do it offhand, but look at the gameplay ability system, almost all of the ability tasks do this by, um, by having an exit pin that happens as soon as they're fired, and then a delegate that fires one of the other exit pins at a later time, like when that node in the task system is finished. I just can't remember it offhand, but we do have documentation about the gameplay ability system, or you could just look in the ability task uh, code, since that's since you're looking for code anyway. Actually, yeah, you know what? Look straight there. Go straight to the <laughs> ability task system code because that'll show you exactly how it's done character for character in a real working example. Sorry, I, I don't know it offhand, but yeah, I know where it is. That's great. I think the question was maybe the user um, didn't know about the functions as well because it's generally easier to write a, f uh, a macro that has several inputs and output execution pins. At least oh. that's what I've seen. Oh, yes. Ma macros are the easier way to do it. Sorry, I was giving you a, a strict how do I do this in code answer. Which is great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now we know that as well. Uh, yeah. O open up the macros. Look at, look at macros. Use those. That's, that's the easiest way to do that. And then the next question leads us into um, how to make macro with U macros in it. Uh, generally, UHT prevents doing that. I'm sorry. I'm not a macro expert. So we'll I've used them before, but I, I don't. How to make a macro with... Multiple um, with U macro. No, I'm sorry, I don't know. That's all right. Um, let's see here. Um, is it hard to pass from blueprints back to C++? Um, do you mean pass? I believe he means um, running a function in blueprints and then pass either a value or then execute something in C++ afterwards. Um, no, it shouldn't be difficult at all. Uh, when you're, so you can, uh, let me see. If you're in, well, let's, let's, let's go both ways. So if you're in C++, what you would do is you would have, uh, well, not, not in there, in, let's say, in our actor. So we have these blueprint callables, right? So what we would have instead is a, uh, is a blueprint and I mentioned this at the very beginning, but I didn't go into detail on it because it was sort of the opposite of what we're doing. Uh, but you have a blueprint implementable event and simple BP event. So this, this function, you can call this function in C++ and it won't do anything unless it's implemented in the blueprint. So then you go into the blueprint that runs and then just on, in C++, it's just the next line of code. So that's, that's pretty simple. Just call this and then do whatever you want, and you have the return value right here. Um, I think you can also pass in parameters like this for output. So you, you, can, you can do this and, and get additional output parameters. That's not the same as additional execution pin outputs, but you can get parameter outputs like that. Uh, so you can do that, and then uh, to go the other way, 
Uh, Blueprint Native events is what you want. So you would you would go into a Blueprint Native event. You would do. I don't think this one. Oh yeah. Uh, we'll just use Begin Play as an easy example. So for Begin Play, what I would do is I would say call the parent function, which is either the next blueprint up the chain or actual C++ code. Call this, and then do whatever I was going to do anyway. And an interesting thing about this is that you don't have to do this. I mean, you typically do it as soon as you come in and you pass all your input parameters into it, and then you take the output parameters from it for whatever you need. But you don't have to do it here. You could do this. You can do this anywhere you want. Like you could do this at the end. You could technically do this from a different function if there were some some case where that seemed uh, appropriate to. Where just put, I put that here, so then this would go here, and probably don't do that. <laughs> that that's you can see visually why that's a bad idea. But um, yeah, like you you could put that wherever you want, and it's completely fine. So in this case, it would do it would do call this and then go do the parent function. Um, in some cases, you want to do that because you might want to prepare something before the parent gets to it, and the parent's going to initialize the thing that you've set up. So you prepare a couple of things, then call the parent. In other cases, you want the parent to initialize everything, do all its stuff, and then you do your work. You could sandwich it between code, like do whatever you want with that. You could, the I mean, again, you could theoretically call this from anywhere or even call it multiple times, but that's super rare that you would ever do that. Um, but yes, so so you can you can go from either one to the other in basically any order you like just by doing that. Well, that's great. Um, got another one. My pure functions require a world context object all the time for some reason. Is there a way to fix that? Uh, okay. Well, um, so depending on what you're doing, they may actually need that, but you can often uh, suppress it. Um, so one thing that I did as a convenience, is it still here? Yeah. So this was a, a convenience here. And I can't remember the exact thing. But mm. uh, if you check the Blueprint Specifiers page, or the, um, the U function Specifiers page in, in our documentation, uh, I, I know I wrote this. So <laughs> I know it's there. <laughs> um, it does exist. Yeah, it definitely exists. Oh, there it is. Uh, wow, I, actually, I guessed it. Amazing. Um, <laughs> so hide pin equals whatever. So what you can do is you can hide a pin, and you could hide uh, you can hide the uh, world context object pin, and then it'll it'll assume that it's self. Uh, you know, with with the yeah with the setup you see here. Mm -hmm. So you can make that pin assume that it's self, and then hide itself. And then in that way, it just won't show up in your editor. You still need the you still need the object mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason your code requires that object. I don't, I don't know without knowing your exact function, but uh, but you can hide it so that it doesn't clutter up your blueprints and people don't have to connect stuff to it. I find that this is usually sufficient um, because people aren't you know designers aren't inclined to attach extra stuff to pins that they don't need to. It just clutters up the blueprint, so right. they. That, that tends to be good enough, and it gives the flexibility in case for some reason I was calling this function on some other object. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can do it if I really want to, but I won't do it by accident. Nice. Um, is there a list of all the meta tags somewhere? I think I, I can't remember if I fully wrote that. I know I wrote <laughs> it at one point. I just don't remember when the last time I updated it. Yes, uh, docs.unrealengine.com. By the way, just about everything I've said other than the API is docs.unrealengine.com. should probably plug that since it's my, you know, my job to write it. No big deal. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so if you go to docs.unrealengine.com, we do have a pretty extensive list of meta tags. I think I updated it a couple of months ago, so it should be reasonably up to date. Um, but yes, we do have that there. And you can also find it in the code if you're more inclined to search that way. Um, I would take the docs page first. <laughs> Let's see. Can we see a function that takes in a wildcard variable? Oh, I'm... Mm. <laughs> Ask me that on the forums, because we, we can do that, but I don't have the time to um, stumble through that live. I right stumbled now. through enough things. <laughs> we'll we'll uh, follow up on that one. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. We'll follow up on it, but didn't consider that for today. Good question. Yeah, it was a good question. That's why I wanted to ask it, because <laughs> I was wondering as well. Um, so let's see. Is there a way to expose C++ properties like variables inside the Blueprint editor? Is there a way to expose C++? Oh, yes. Um, Actually, I think I did it a little bit earlier and then erased it. So we'll do it again. 
Um, so yeah, so a C plus plus like this. So U property. Uh, okay, so this just exposes it to Unreal's uh, reflection system, uh, which basically means that the Unreal engine knows about this variable. Um, exciting variable name. So, so this just means that the engine knows about it. Your blueprints can't see it yet. But if it's, you can have blueprint read only or blueprint read write, and that will allow you to either just reference it or actually set it in your uh, in your blueprint, so that's one thing. Now you may also want edit instance only, which means um, when you're in the blueprint editor, like in here, it would show up like over here under variables, and you could uh, and you can edit it, or you could have. I'm sorry, no, that means you can only edit it when it's placed in the world. Edit defaults only is what I just described, and then you can also have edit anywhere. Um, if you're just sort of tinkering around, put edit anywhere. Uh, it's, it's just, you know, blueprint rewrite, edit anywhere. Like that gives you read and write access during, in, in blueprint graphs. And you can edit it either on a placed object in the world or in the, uh, in the blueprint editor itself for, for all the objects that use that blueprint. Um, that's kind of the easiest way to go. You also have a couple other options like visible anywhere. Visible defaults only, visible instance only. And that's just like the edit options, except it's grayed out, so you can't edit it. But you can see what it is. Um, that's good for debug values. Like, you might want to pause the game and be like, okay, why is, this, why is this thing going crazy? And you pause, and you can look at some variable. It's like, oh, my velocity is 8,000. But I, didn't want, I don't want users to be, or designers or whatever, to, to have access to editing that value because it could be messed up. Uh, velocity is not the best example because that's kind of an easy one to change. But imagine it's some sort of some sort of internal counter that you don't want people messing with or like a list of, of pointers to other objects, you can still put it there with visible instance only so you can pause the game and see it uh, without accidentally being able to edit it or clear it and like crash your game or whatever when your game's not expecting that. Um, as bonus points on that, and I don't want to go too far, but um, blueprint getter and blueprint setter. Um, those are things that you want, those are, those, what those do is when you set or get the variable in Blueprint, you have a U function, uh, and you name the U function here at like Blueprint getter equals function name. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere else you have a U function, and that U function will be called when you set the variable. So instead of setting the variable directly, it'll run through your code to set it. Um, and that can be pretty convenient for, one, for tracking, if you want to see like, okay, where is this getting set? Like, I want to have a debug log output every time you set this to see if you're setting, you know, some, this is getting set 500 times in a loop, or like right. this is getting set to a weird invalid value somewhere, and I don't know where. Um, really good for debugging like that, or good for just if you, like, let's say I need to set my character's uh, current item that's in hand, and when I do this, I might need to reset my animation because maybe I'm doing an animation that's specific to another item. So I would just want to be notified that, hey, someone just set the in-hand item. We may need to break animation or, or do something. Um, so setters and getters are really useful for that. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot you can do with that. There's a lot you can do with the engine in general. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot you can do with the <laughs> engine in general, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, real quickly, someone in chat had found the metadata Oh, good. So I did drop them in the Twitch channel. So. Oh, great. Thank Shout you. Shout out to Jeremy. <laughs> Sweet. We well, can put them on the <laughs> relevant section of the forum post as well. Yep. Um, oh, yeah. Since it came up. Uh, this one was interested. Um, what is required to allow a Blueprint node to be switched between pure and non-pure, like the Cast2 node? So I believe they, they believe when you write it in C++, um, and then being able to give it that functionality when you're working with the function in Blueprints. OK, so let me just, I just want to make sure I have this straight. The question is, you have a Blueprint node that you want to make either pure or not pure? Right, like the Cast. Mm -hmm like the cast node. Okay, so um, when, you, uh, when you const cast, I'm not sure if this is what we're talking about, when you const cast, that is for variables. Um, so you, you take a const pointer or, or something like that and you cast it to a non-const pointer. In fact, that's the only way you go. You never cast to const because anything can implicitly be const, right? I can have a variable and just say, promise not to change this. But if I give you a variable that has a, I promise not to change it, and you're going to change it, I, I actually can't give you that variable in C++. It, it won't accept that, because it'll say, no, that's not a changeable one, and I need a changeable one. But 
if I need an unchangeable one and you give me a changeable one, that's fine. I can just not mess with it. Um, so casting like that is for variables, not for functions. But uh, my best effort at answering that uh, question, in case you meant something slightly different, would be if you have a blueprint pure function, one, stop calling it blueprint pure, call it blueprint callable, but not, or, or whatever, but not pure. Take that, um, <laughs> take that specifier off. And then two, if the function is labeled as const, uh, when, uh, when, when it's compiling, it's going to pick up that it's called const and make it appear automatically. So take the const specifier off of it too. Now that uh, const correctness is a thing, and this is just general C++, that it's like you're all in or you're not, right? It's um, because if you just take the const off of a given function uh, or, or add a const to a function where it wasn't before, everything that feeds into it might have, be, might have been using, you know, const objects. And now suddenly it says, whoa, whoa, whoa you're a non-const function. I can't call you on this const object anymore. And so it'll, it'll sort of ripple through your entire code base. Um, I do encourage using const, you know, where possible, but you have to be vigilant about it. If you, if you do it halfway or you start trying to take it off later, you could run into some compile problems where you end up going, okay, well, now this function calls me Oh, but it's, now uh, we got a const problem. Okay, so fix that. And then you go, oh, but another function calls that one. And you could just have a thing that just leads you on this breadcrumb trail through your entire code base's worth of const. Um, so just, just be careful about messing with, uh, messing with const. I would say practice being thorough with it and, and get it right, you know, the first time as best you can. Yeah, I believe, I believe someone was wondering if, if, it was, if you were able to make a function and then give the designer the option to make it pure or impure? Uh, no, when you've made a function, you've decided what it is. The, the designer can't do that. But you could do what I did in, the, um, in this, which is I gave you a pure version and, a, and just a regular uh, callable version, right? Here's a callable version, here's a pure version. And both of those are really just thin wrappers on the actual function right here. So you can, whoops. So you could you could easily just make two versions, and a lot of times programmers will will just do this at the end. So that way, uh, when you're looking through the when you're looking through the code, you'll see, you know, you start looking up fib, and then you'll just see a couple options because it's the end of the word. So that's a pretty convenient way to give it to uh, your designers. They can't have exactly the same name. Like you can't do this, right? Like that's that's not going to compile. But you can do that. Um, so yeah, that, that's how I would do it if you want to give them the option. Just give them two versions. That's great. Huh. Pretty sure we covered that. I think so. If not, let us know. Um, uh, how does the engine handle multiple interface implementations from different bases? I believe they mean base classes. Is it base classes or sources, maybe? Um, from different bases, that's... I'm not entirely sure what that means. Not entirely sure either. Do you okay? So the so interfaces um, that are visible to Unreal generally come from this. They come from U interface. Now I was actually thinking earlier today. I've never written an interface that inherits from another interface. I don't think ever. Not just in Unreal, but I've never. I've been programming C and C plus plus since the late 1990s, and I've actually never done that. So I actually <laughs> don't know if that's what you mean, but uh, generally this, I mean, this is the pattern I've seen every single time. Um, so you have this, which is just, this is an interface in Unreal, boilerplate thing, requires no, nothing other than this in the H file. And then you have the actual interface here. And then when you go to your actor, uh, you have, I mean, you can have multiple interfaces on it. Um, now, if you mean inheriting from multiple bases, like something that inherits a actor and a pawn at the same time, um, never do that. <laughs> <laughs> Just never do that. It's, it's the, um, what is it, the dread diamond, I think, is the, uh, is the, is the term for this. Um, inheriting from multiple base classes can get you in super big trouble, and um, don't do it. Uh, that's, that's really what interfaces are for. If, if you find that you really want to do that, because you're going to say, well, but this thing is a one, and it is also a two. It is both of those things, so I want to inherit. What I would do in, in that case, and this has happened to me before, so it's, 
it's a situation that I've encountered, but is take those essential properties that make something A1 or that make something A2, take those properties and move them out to an interface. And then your, your thing that is a, a, an actor that is also a one is an actor that, in, that inherits the interface for one, and your actor that's a two inherits the interface for two, and your new actor that's the, the hybrid of those two is an actor that inherits one and two interfaces. Yeah. Um, and that way you end up really clean and you don't have problems. So just to give you a, an example of where you'd have a problem, we have a function get f name, which gets the name of an object in your scene. Um, pretty simple, you use it for debugging a lot. Um, so if I ask for the f name from uh, something that inherits from both actor and pawn, or better yet, uh, pawn and, I don't know, shape component, whatever, like two just totally different things. Um, which one? Like, which one did I mean to call? And that, that's kind of the problem. Like, you'll have functions and variables with the same name as each other, and when you're coding, it's not necessarily clear to the language which one you're trying to call. Um, so I wouldn't do that. Also, in this engine, we have the concept of a superclass, and that's only one class. That's a keyword that refers to one class, and in that case, that's this one. Uh, so when you go to go up the chain with an inherited function, we have the super, and that there's only one way up the chain. Um, that keeps everything simple, and that's this. This is exactly what interfaces are designed to fix. So I, I hope that helps. Cool. Um, can a single in input on a C++ function taking in multiple items uh, and not be assigned as an array? Can. Um. Can you read um, that one again? Let's see. Can a single Oh yeah, that's a little, it's worded a little strangely. Yeah. Can a single input on a C++ function maybe take in multiple items and not be assigned as an array? So they've noticed some nodes do this, like setting components to hidden in game. Um, they're not really sure if it's even possible in blueprints. You can give it several targets. Oh, so oh, oh. Yeah. Um, yes, I believe you can do that. Um, I avoid doing that in general. Because you, so you mean like... Do like a set like hidden or like there would be like mul you mean like mm -hmm. there would be like multiple things going to yeah. that except it wouldn't clear one like it just did, right? It yeah. works on a set hidden I think set visibility and a couple others. Oh yeah, set hidden. So I believe in the back end it's just running that function twice then if you would have two different um, two different targets that you're passing to it. Yeah, so like another mesh or. And it will actually do it on, on both of them. Yeah, it will do it on both of them. You know what? I know about this, and I've never seen how it's done before. Let's go on a, on a brief magical journey here <laughs> and see if we can find this answer. No guarantees that we'll find the answer here, but let's just see what happens. Where is my code? Uh, okay. Is that hidden? I did say go to code, right? Yes. It okay. might be s loading. That hidden in game target is scene component. Well, if the target is scene component, <laughs> wait, what class am I in? A little quest here. <laughs> yeah, let's just see. I mean, I'm not guaranteeing that we're even going to find this, so we'll, we'll spend like a minute on it, and then it becomes a uh, a forum question, I think. <laughs> Um Yeah, we may we may have to hold this one. <laughs> yeah, this I mean that yeah, it's, it's generally good to know how things work in the back end though as well cuz then you know some good practices on how to use things and some less than optimal. That is really interesting. It's ju it's just a blueprint callable with that. I I don't actually so Oh, but it doesn't Wait a minute. This is a straight C file. Wait. This is no it isn't. This is in the using component. Yeah, so this is the function. Huh. I actually I actually don't know, but you've got me really interested now. Um, yeah, it, it is interesting that it doesn't it doesn't say what object it's on and that you can take you can put in multiple objects. This is definitely a good one for the forums. We should we should absolutely look into this. We will. Thank you. That's 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 like at least two of those today. Yeah. This is, a, <laughs> this is an unusually productive screen stream for these kind of questions. <laughs> They'll sneak up on you. All right, let's see. 
Um, will we ever get the ability to pass around delegates? <laughs> <laughs> I can already tell this, this is like, <laughs> will you please make a promise live on the stream <laughs> or something that you don't control? Uh, I'm um, hoping maybe they can, <laughs> or at least we can ask her to dig into. Uh, will we ever get the ability to pass around delegates, event, uh, <coughs> to pass around delegates, event dispatchers as blueprint variables, function parameters, interface methods, etc. Um, for example, a uh, blueprint interface that has a method that returns an event dispatcher you can bind assign and assign to. I know in our uh, online subsystems code, which you know we use for interfacing with uh, things like whatever uh, Steam, PSN, Xbox Live, all, all that kind of you know online platforms. In there, a lot of our functions take. Um, as input parameters, they take these these delegates. So you'll say like, uh, here I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna call this function on the remote system. Call me back on this delegate when it's done, and then that delegate will come back and tell you if it succeeded or failed or, mm -hmm. or whatever it is. So in some cases, the delegates are built into the system, and you just use the system's delegate, and that's fine. And those are usually cases where you can only have one of those calls going at a time. But in other cases where you could you could have multiple requests out at once, uh, you provide your own delegate. So I know you can pass them to the C++, but I don't think that, I don't think I've ever seen a delegate be passed back from a C++. I don't know if I've seen it be passed from C++ to, especially not to Blueprint. Hmm. I'm not sure if we have that ability or not. That's an interesting one. I think the create session function is quite interesting in itself, though, because of the fact that it does return successful, and at that point when that executes, you can use the data that was returned, whatever. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> hey, Sam. Uh, um. Hey, Sam. Not, <laughs> <laughs> not at this time. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> I'm wondering if he wants to do something here. All right. Too I, bad. I don't know. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Preparing for <laughs> coming streams, maybe? <laughs> um, yeah. Let me see. Uh, sorry, that that distracted me just a little bit. Yeah. Um, create session node. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, a lot of times, what we'll do is you'll pass a delegate in, and it'll come back. But you you can you can hook to the delegate when it comes back. But I don't think I've seen it as a return value to a blueprint. I don't think I've seen that exact thing. And there may be a reason why that's why that's not done. Um, that is a pretty deep technical question there. Yeah, they just mentioned exposing C++ blueprints part two. <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, if we if we do have a collection of a couple of these things, we might be able to do a part two of these the next time I'm available to do a stream, which I hope is sooner. Or, sooner you know, than later? Yeah, sooner rather than how long it was since the previous <laughs> one I did. We also got GDC coming up. Yeah, it'll be after that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it'll be That's after sort that. Of what I was GDC keeps people a little bit busy. That is correct. Uh, um. So there was a follow-up, um, and they're saying the cast to anything, mm -hmm. node and blueprint, uh, when right-clicked on, gives the option to convert to pure. So constant, or constant issue aside, um, how would they give a C++ function that particular ability to the designer from within C++, or can they? I am, I am completely not, okay, right-clicking on what gives you the ability to? Uh, a cast to anything node. Oh. Okay. Cast two. Okay. And okay. So, and so then, when you right click, um, at the bottom it has convert to. Okay. Pure. So that's a okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I didn't realize that what you're talking about. Yes, that that is a special engine feature, um, because you have you you can basically you can do this you can do this function in either way. Uh, both of those are supported. I'm not sure how they toggle it. Um, Let's see. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not actually sure how they do that, but I'm not sure if that's available in general or if that's specifically just done for casts. Like you'll notice, for example, that it it specifically says cast right in here. I think this might be. I think this might be special to uh, to casting in blueprints. I'm not sure that that's a a general purpose feature. Um, I don't think it is, but I don't know. I could be wrong about that. Cool. Yeah. There are some special instances in blueprints where, yeah, casting is um, is kind of its own its own special thing, and it's all auto generated. So, 
I think that might be special for casting. But maybe I'm wrong. Part two. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think. I think we may see. have done it. Oh, th this one's pretty good. I almost missed this one. Okay. Um, can you show how to make a conversion node? For example, float to vector. Oh, yeah. Or at least uh, an example of it. Um, yeah, so th those conversion nodes, I wonder if we can see this one in code. These are, I mean, these are basically just, um, they're pure nodes, but there's, it's on the, it's, it's either, I think it's a meta tag. Uh, let's see if we can find the definition of this. <laughs> or are we going to do this again? Um, maybe this doesn't know that it's associated with the thing that's open. Yeah, you can save that. Probably won't compile at this point, but whatever. Um, yeah, there, I, I, I remember writing this into the uh, specifiers page. So or the specifiers are the meta tags page. So this is documented, but let's see if we can find it. Let's reopen Visual Studio. And uh, Sam, Sam told me to apologize to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> he forgot it was Thursday. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Well, let me go to my... Oh, this is not a good time for not letting me go to my symbols. Hmm. All right. It's documented somewhere. I believe it's... it's there's, there's like a meta tag that you put on the U function... Um, that just tells it to be like minimal style. I forget exactly what the word is, but it's, it's on, I believe, either the meta tag page or the U function specifier page. But one of those two at docs.unrealengine.com, it's written down there. I can't remember what the exact tag is. But that's basically all it is. There's, there's just a tag that says like minimal style, like hide, it's like hide all, hide all pins or something like that. Hide pin names, something about... It's something about that. I can't remember exactly what it's... Called. That's a little too fast for me to read. <laughs> um, someone said you might be able to find examples of those in the Unreal Math library. Uh, this is not the right file. <laughs> so many maths. Yeah. Well, there is a lot of math in this engine. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, when we do these things live, I don't have as much time to search through, but uh, hide. Mm. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say check the docs on this because I know, I know this is documented. I remember, uh, I remember when I wrote it, but it's uh, it's just going to take too long to find in here. Yeah, they mentioned Blueprint Autocast and Compact Node Title. That sounds super, super familiar. I think I think you found it. <laughs> I didn't. You didn't. Chat did. Chat. chat. Well, yes, I, chat. I, meant, I meant chat. Chat found it, yes. Uh, yeah, I think that's how you do it. So, yeah, um, but just, just look on those pages or do exactly what chat just said. That, that really sounds familiar. I'm pretty sure that's it. <laughs> nice work, chat. Thank you, chat. Yeah. Well, we need to wrap up for today. We'll grab the last few questions, and if you don't mind, we'll pass them along to you. Um, yeah, that'd be and great. And then we can follow up with some of the ones we tried to answer but didn't quite get to or didn't have the answers for you. We can toss those in the forum and uh, follow up with you all there. Yeah, hopefully uh, we can do another stream on this, too. There, yeah. there were a lot yeah. of interesting questions. I didn't think that much was going to come out of it, but that was really interesting stuff. Chat's pretty good about uh, <laughs> they have inquiring minds. Yeah. So um, if you haven't... Uh, looked in chat yet? I've tossed the survey in there. Let us know how we're doing, what kinds of topics you'd like to see in the future. Uh, it helps us know because these are for you, and if you tell us what you want, then we can help you out. Um, always check for your local UE4 meetups, meetup.com slash pro slash Unreal Engine. There's lots of cool events hopefully going on in your area, and if they're not in your area, then you can start one yourself. And th it's a great way to get to know people. Um, they can give you feedback on your projects or help you learn, and it's always it's always better with a group, I feel like, when you're trying to learn something new. Tackle uh, hard problems. And yeah. Uh, Want to talk about our spotlights and the countdown? For, um, 
<laughs> next week. Sorry. Now you call me Just off guard general. here. Just in general. Um, you can find our spotlights on the uh, forum post for um, this live stream, which is under um, our, our forums uh, events. Uh, it should be sticking for another day or two. Um, we will also put them inside the uh, YouTube um, description once that goes live uh, as well. Spotlights. And, and then where can they, where do we look? To find spotlights. Oh, where we look to find <laughs> spotlights. Um, <laughs> most commonly, if you post them on the forum mm -hmm. uh, under released or work in progress, yep. um, we tend to want to spotlight items that, and projects um, where it's relevant to provide traffic to the developers yeah. um, for what they're doing. And sometimes just something that we find very um, exciting and interesting in general. So that's a good place. You can always hit us up as well on uh, Discord, on the forums. Um, or uh, community at unrealengine.com. Mm -hmm. uh, that's also where you should send, uh, if you want to provide us with another one of the sped up five minute videos uh, that, we, that we show for the countdown to, uh, for the stream. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's 30 minutes of content and we ask that, so you know, record yourself for 30 minutes and then squash that down to five minutes. And again, at community at unrealengine.com. And usually, you know, send us your game your or your, uh, a link, your logo, you know, title of your studio if you have one, and we'll work on adding that to our rotation. Um, and then, yeah, if you fill out that survey, there's a chance that you could be win an Unreal Engine T-shirt. So I know those are a hot commodity. Um, and yeah, be sure to follow us on social media, all the things. We'd love checking out what you're doing, so you may get a follow back. Um, and what's on for next week? Uh, next week we will be doing basically Niagara Part Two. Essentially. So if you, Wyeth and Sean will be joining us again. So it should be an exciting stream. And thank you again for joining us. Yeah, thanks a bunch, Richard. Oh, thanks. This is great fun. Yeah. So we'll be on the lookout for a part two maybe this spring. So all right. <laughs> <Around> there. <laughs> we'll see you all next week. Thank Bye. you for coming.